Bonjour, installez-vous. Donc euh, nous sommes très heureux euh, aujourd'hui d'accueillir pour un nouveau séminaire de santé publique David Buckeridge qui travaille avec nous, euh, donc il est à McGill, et, euh, professeur, il s'occupe, euh, donc il est dans le département d'épidémiologie, biostatistique euh, et euh, santé travail. Et, euh, et en fait, il est responsable aussi euh, du parcours euh, santé publique, euh, du master porté euh, au sein de ce même département. Et euh, en fait, on, il fait partie de nos principaux collaborateurs dans le cadre euh, du partenariat qu'on a établi pour l'école universitaire de recherche euh, Digital Public Health, c'est le master Public Health Data Science. Et, euh, et donc, il nous a il fait la joie de nous rendre visite euh, ici et pour nous présenter justement cette thématique de recherche euh, qui a un double intérêt pour nous. Le premier, c'est que ça parle vraiment de santé publique. Et euh, le deuxième, c'est que c'est euh, l'utilisation de euh, nouvelles approches, en particulier autour euh, de l'intelligence artificielle et ce dont il va nous parler euh, aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup, David, d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Avec plaisir, merci beaucoup. Et euh, euh, je peux parler français, peut-être pas assez bien pour toutes les présentations en français, donc euh, j'ai fait la présentation en anglais, mais je suis content de parler après et prendre vos questions en français. J'espère que ça, ça, ça va bien pour vous. OK, so... Um, Going to talk, sorry, I'll talk about some work that we've been doing for the last three or four years to uh, develop and evaluate uh, digital technologies for surveillance in the context of a project called the Population Health Record. Uh, so I'll start with a bit of context and theory. So why, why are we doing this work? What are we trying to accomplish? And I'll get into some of the work around creating some novel indicators for population health. Uh, and then a little bit more at the end around some software platforms we've built to try and help people to intelligently use those indicators. So first of all, in terms of context and theory, it's, it's really about going from data to decisions. And this is a topic that I think most people are, are quite aware of. Essentially that we have lots and lots and lots of data. It used to be, I remember when I started my training, which doesn't seem that long ago now, everybody said, well, we don't have enough data. Well, now we have lots of data, that's for sure. Sometimes getting access to it can be challenging, but there are lots of data. And this is a, a, a diagram from a paper in JAMA recently, just showing different types of structured un and unstructured data going in the columns. Of course, structure being the kind of things you can easily fit into variables within a, a database. I'm too tall. Okay, sorry. Uh, in into a database. And, um, and then we also have unstructured, which is just more like free text, things you might type out, but they're not really in a database. And as you can see, we spent a lot of our time in kind of the top left corner there, but there's a lot of data to explore. However, when we want to do something in population health, it's not just data we care about. We need some knowledge. We need to know how do we interpret those data? What are we going to do with those data? And of course, especially as we think about chronic diseases, things are quite complex. What I'm showing here is, is the final, uh, final conceptual graph, common, or known to many as a spaghetti map, that came out of the Foresight Project in the United Kingdom, where they tried to map out the causal effects of obesity. Just to point out that in chronic disease, uh, and also in infectious disease, increasingly we're realizing that the pathways, the causal pathways, are very complex. So if you really want to bring together this data and this evidence, uh, we have to be able to do it in some sort of a structured way. And so that's why the theory of evidence-based public health I find particularly compelling. And I don't know, has anybody heard of this theory after Brownson? No, okay. So the idea is just that you have this environmental organizational context in which public health happens. And then we have resources within that context. You can think of resources as people, we can think of resources as systems, those kinds of things that you need to get work done. And then we have the best available research evidence. Evidence that comes through research like people do here, through systematic reviews, other processes that tells us what are the interventions we can do to make a difference in public health. And then finally, we have information about defined populations. So information different from evidence. This is information we've, we've created by pulling together data, calculating indicators that measure discrete aspects of population health. And all this theory says is that if you can have the best available evidence in the same place as the best information with the right resources, you're going to make the best decisions. It's not terribly revolutionary by any means, but it's a nice framework for thinking about the things we want to bring together for better public health decision making. 
And so it's in that context that we began to build something called a population health record, which is not an idea that we came up with. It had been around for a while. It's analogous to an electronic medical record a physician would use. And if you think about that, a clinician with a patient in front of them uses an electronic medical record to integrate data from laboratories, from radiology results, from drugs, that kind of thing. So they have a complete picture of all the things happening with that one patient. And then, of course, they can layer decision support on top of that, too, to identify interesting problems and to track their attention to those. And so that's essentially what we're trying to do in public health here. Uh, for a defined population in public health, we want to be able to pull together all the relevant pieces of information, organize them according to determinants of health framework, and then be able to layer on top of that some kind of intelligence. So this project has been going on for quite some time. The original idea, is, as I know it, was published uh, in 2010. Uh, we received a rather large infrastructure award after that to start to build the software framework for what we're doing. Uh, and then after that, we received funding from our federal uh, research funding agency and our federal public health agency to actually continue to build this platform, add new indicators, and then roll it out into public health practice. And currently, we're working closely with the, the province of Quebec, about 8 million people, to, to roll the, the, uh, this platform out so it will be available in different health uh, regions in the province. Okay, so what is this thing I'm talking about? This is kind of a cartoon of, of what a population health record looks like as we've Im implemented it. Uh, if you look at the bottom, these are the data that we pull in at the individual level. These are da these data. So for the, for the most part, we're, we're using administrative data as the, the core sort of backbone of, of our, our system. However, we have created it so we can actually link it also to clinical data. And these would be laboratory results, uh, imaging studies, uh, and we're about to make access to these data public in, in Quebec in a way that can be linked to the administrative data. Uh, those get rolled up. We create individual level indicators about mainly health outcomes and healthcare utilization. For exposures, of course, we have a hard time getting individual level data, so we use a variety of sources you see on, the, on the, your left to try to get uh, indicators you can drive down to the highest spatial temporal resolution into which we can situate these people so we have some sense of what they're exposed to. Uh, and then we can calculate those indicators, and we, we use something uh, relatively novel called an ontology, which I'll come back to, to organize that information, and then we push it out to different users. Uh, mainly, we've been focusing on public health, although increasingly we're starting to work into health systems, and we're getting excited about making this available to the general public and thinking what they might do with this information. The two sort of novel things here really are, one, this real-time capacity, so we can just pull in these raw claims data, a process that takes most public health agencies months, uh, we can do almost instantly go from raw claims data into a public health indicators. Uh, and then the second is we use this, this, these ontologies, which are formal representations of knowledge, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, as a way to organize all, that, all those indicators that, that we're, we're bringing into the system. So the current, um, as I mentioned, we're about to go in, uh, make this available for the whole province of Quebec. But to develop the system, we've been working with um, uh, a sample of data for the greater Montreal area, which you can see shown here in yellow. That's around 4 million people in total, and we have a 25% random sample of the entire population starting in 1998, and then we follow those people forward as an open cohort, replacing deaths and out-migration with births and in-migration, so we always have a representative 25%, uh, and we keep following those people. So for some of these people, we have over tw almost 20 years of data. Um, as I mentioned, we are implementing this project in, uh, in Quebec now, and we've gone through a, a number of, of actually fairly complex steps as a researcher, even I'm a public health physician as well, but didn't fully realize how complex it is to put a, a kind of disruptive information technology within a government entity. Uh, and so it's been a lot of work to go through all the, all the steps we have to to get that done, but we're at the process now of connecting that application to data for all 8 million people in Quebec uh, and validating those indicators that we're measuring. And then the idea is to first make it available to all public health departments in the province, and then after that we will do cluster randomized trials where we can add new functionalities to the system uh, and make those available in a randomized way to some health regions and then measure the impact of that additional either decision-making capability or information on what they do. So that's just the background. I'm going to say a bit now about some of the indicators we've calculated. Uh, we make we've, three types of indicators that have gone to the system, uh, ones that are coming out of digital health data, uh, ones that come out of uh, digital retail data, uh, and ones that come out of survey and census. I'm going to talk mainly about the, the middle one, but I'll say just a few quick words about the health data that we use. Probably familiar to many of you that work with claims data uh, or clinical data. 
We start really with the administrative data, which you see on the top row, uh, which come from our provincial health insurer in Quebec called the RAMQ. That's in gray, which show uh, both uh, physician billing uh, and drug prescriptions for those that are covered. We can also get hospitalization details or events from a different data source called MedEcho in our, our, our uh, context. And then we can also get vital statistics data. So that gives us, if you will, a backbone kind of what happens to a person. Where we're going to, as I mentioned, is to be able to link in these more richer uh, Dossier Santé Québec data, which would be the laboratory data, radiology results, and so on. Ultimately, we'd like to get right down and pull in EMR data as well and be able to link those in, but uh, that's going to take a few more years in Quebec before we're able to access EMR data from primary care. And so, as I mentioned, we have this automated pipeline, essentially, that goes from raw data. Uh, essentially, we take case definitions that have been created and validated by our public health partners. We implement those in SQL, which is a database language, uh, and then database those databases uh, essentially are, are pulling the raw data and creating a series of fact tables. So for every person in our system, we want to tag them with the incident date of every chronic disease we're aware of or that we have a, a, um, uh, a case definition for. And then once they're in these fact tables, we can then go back and hit those fact tables to roll up subpopulations in real time to any response that anybody makes to the system. Okay, so that's the health data. Now I'm gonna talk a bit more, uh, a bit about the retail data because I think this is kind of a little more interesting and novel. So, oh, before I show you that, it's too late perhaps. I don't know how good your vision is, but if you were to take all premature death and disability in France, okay, premature death, so potential years of life lost, disabilities, life lived with disability, divide into three bins, injury, maternal and infectious diseases, and chronic diseases, which would have the biggest bin? Chronic, I hear chronic, okay, that's good. Anyone I want to put a number on it? What percent is chronic disease of all premature death and disability in France, 2017? 90? You're close, it's 85, 85. So 85%, this is from the Global Burden Disease Study. You can quibble, you can quibble with their methods, and many do, but uh, this is the picture. And so this is one of the reasons why, actually I began doing a lot of my research career in surveillance of infectious diseases, and I still do a lot of work in infectious diseases, but. I realize we need to do a lot better job surveilling chronic disease because literally that's where the problem is. Um, so if you think about that, what do you think is the number one modifiable risk factor for all this disability? Modifiable. I only wish, I only wish age was modifiable. <laughs> Gender is modifiable. but. Uh, there's some debate, there, there is some debate, but in Canada anyway, the number one is dietary risks. I'm pretty sure it's in France, but I didn't have time to update it. Smoking comes a close second, and then there's a number of other risk factors that are also related to nutrition and to diet. So this is again from the uh, Global Burden Disease Study, and you can quibble with their methods, but I think most people would agree that what you eat, especially if it's unhealthy, is probably one of the most important determinants of health that is, that is modifiable. And I don't know what you do here in Quebec, or sorry, here in, in France, but uh, in, in Canada, we do a very bad job of measuring what people eat. Uh, we essentially ask them what, what, what you ate, and we do that infrequently, and we know they do a very job, bad job answering us. So, one thing we said, and, and this is something that as we were putting together the population health record, we noticed that we had great data on people getting sick. We knew a lot about disease, we knew some things about some upstream exposures, but in terms of diet, we really had no good data. We literally had a survey that's done every 10 years in Canada and gives us data at the level of a city or, or a health region. And so we wanted to try and find new ways to measure this. And so we went and talked to our colleagues in, in management um, and the business school, and we started looking to see what they're, they're doing. Uh, and they are working a lot with data of food scanning. So, you know, every time you buy something now, it gets scanned, it makes a beep, it goes into a database. Uh, and in many cases, those data get aggregated. And so in, in North America, there's two major players that would aggregate these data. Companies like the Nielsen Corporation, which is a multinational, they aggregate all those sales data. And then they, in fact, they don't aggregate, they keep it very disaggregated, but they bring it together. And then they do their own analyses and sell those results back to retailers and manufacturers for marketing purposes. Um, However, what's really interesting is because they keep these data very disaggregated, they actually have the, the little barcode on them still, essentially. And so we can link every row of what is sold 
to nutrition information about that product. Uh, and then we can make some assessments to whether that product is healthy or not. Uh, and in addition to those big multinationals that, that, that aggregate those data, I should also mention that most uh, stores in North America actually also now have retail loyalty programs where you can get a card. And every time you go and you buy something, give them your card, they give you points on your card, and that's an incentive to keep coming to their store. But it also then allows you to track families or households over time in terms of their food purchasing, which becomes uh, even more interesting. So we've acquired some of these data through partnerships. Uh, this one actually purchased from Nielsen Corporation. So this is store level data. So there's no individual attributes on this at all. All we know is the store it came from. Uh, and what you see is the these data are on the bottom here. So you can see it's, it's, it's by week, but by product. So for every product, we get the total amount sold in that week, the price the, the consumer paid for it, uh, and a number of other characteristics, including whether that item was being promoted in the store, which is quite helpful. And then we can go after business directory listings, which is the top table. It's an example of the top table, which gives us a sampling frame, if you will. So we know where all the stores are, and we know the ones that we've sampled, and we have literally detailed transactional data on what was purchased from the stores uh, that were sampled. And so I've had a number of uh, PhD students working on this for the last few years, and, and one was looking particularly at uh, fruits and vegetables. And so she went and basically looked to see if she could create standard baskets based on different types of fruits and vegetables, which she was quite able to do. Uh, and then she wanted to use those baskets to really develop and evaluate indicators around different areas of, of understanding what is it, what's the, what's the challenge in some ways, or what are some of the challenges for people, people purchasing uh, and eating enough fruits and vegetables? And so she looked at things like accessibility and whether accessibility really is a good proxy for affordability and seasonal and temporal patterns uh, in affordability. So there's actually pretty marked seasonal uh, fluctuation in prices of fruits and vegetables, which if you are very close to the poverty line can be quite challenging in terms of making sure you're buying enough food. Uh, and also looked at availability and variety by chain and region. One particular interesting result was sort of this issue of the food desert. So I don't know if this has been as much a, an issue in, in, uh, in Europe, but in North America, there's been this concept that if you're in a poorer area, you're less likely to have stores that sell healthy food. And so it creates this, essentially a desert of healthy food and you have to travel farther to get healthy food. So this has actually led to people, in fact, as public health interventions, building grocery stores, saying what we really need to do is physically build a grocery store, put it in a place where there's not sufficient access, and that will solve the problem. Those interventions are very expensive, and there haven't been many of them, but they haven't been effective. Uh, and so what we did is we look, had, took the data we had, and we said, well, can we look at the incremental effect of having more, of course, we're not building stores, but we're looking to see if, if there are more stores in a region versus others, does that affect the price somehow of fruits and vegetables? And what we saw was that uh, rural areas are sown in orange here, and urban in blue, and on your left are fruits, and on your right are vegetables. And what we're showing is, is the, the incremental change in price uh, of that standard basket if there's an additional store. And as we can see, in, uh, in urban areas, it, doesn't make, it actually tends to go the other way around. We say when you're adding another store, it tends to drive the price up, particularly for vegetables. Uh, and this was fairly robust looking at this from multiple different perspectives. And so it, it, I think it just challenges the assumption that the real the issue is access to grocery stores. And in fact, as we're getting better to learn more and more about how people travel to access food, food stores, uh, this result is in fact uh, making sense in that context. The other area we've looked at is sort of the new tobacco, which is sugar. Uh, and so looking at, at uh, carbonated soft drinks. Um, and this is a paper that just came out in the uh, International Journal of Epi. Looking at, uh, again, store level data, but we're trying to see now uh, the effect of discounting on the relationship between price and purchasing. So I'm sure most people understand the concept of elasticity, which says that as the price goes down, purchasing goes up, and vice versa. As price goes up, purchasing goes down. What we're talking here now is effect modification of elasticity by area level education. So we want to look at stores where we knew they were selling a lot of pop, and on these plots here, you're seeing the discount on the x-axis and the amount sold on the y-axis for two types of stores, supermarkets on the top and pharmacies on the bottom. A bit different in North America than here. Pharmacies in North America have really gotten into selling all sorts of things other than medications and so on, and in fact make a lot of the revenue now from selling things like pop, which is a bit of an interesting question for a pharmacy. But anyway, so um, what we did is we divided the, uh, the areas with stores into tertiles of, of education based on census data. And the uh, lowest tertile is the darkest line, and the highest tertile is the most dotted line. 
And so what we're showing is particularly in pharmacies, as discount rate goes up, the rate of increase of purchasing is much higher for uh, the lowest tertile of education as compared to the highest tertile of education. We saw a similar sort of result for income, but not as pronounced, which is, as the literature suggests, and is also somewhat encouraging, because it suggests that this is, in, some, in fact, something that could possibly be addressed through intervention. But this is important from a policy perspective because there's a lot of discussion about taxation of sugary soft drinks as a way of decreasing uh, purchasing. So what we're showing here, though, is that taxation can easily be overcome by discounting, and it has non-differential effects. So it actually has inequitable effects. And if we have inequitable effects at the time of purchasing unhealthy foods, we can be almost certain those are going to continue through to inequities and chronic diseases. Um, we've also done some work to, to sort of go beyond um, carbonated soft drinks and to see if we can predict out. So this is showing you the sampled stores we have in the Montreal area as stars and the, and the sampling frame as circles. And we've shown that we can build actually very, very accurate machine learning models that can predict the sales at other stores based on the stores that we observe for product categories. So we're fairly confident that we can go from the data we have for multiple categories and actually predict out and have pretty much full sales estimates at all stores, allowing us to do more sophisticated spatio-temporal modeling of exposures. And this is one example of, of work that we started to do using um, uh, Bayesian hierarchical modeling. Again, because we don't have stores in every region, but we know we have people in every region, we want to be able to come up with estimates of exposure for every region. And so this is just one, one example of, of a result where we can come up with a posterior spatial layer that gives us a measure of latent, in this case, carbonated soft drink demand for every region uh, that we are interested in. And so that was all store level data. What I think is interesting, uh, but also raises all sorts of other questions, is to look at um, retail data. So the nice thing about store level data is you get like a really representative sample across all retailers and all regions. However, by working with one single retailer, what you can get is that longitudinal pattern which is really critical for understanding much more in terms of what's, what's changing behavior. So we um, have a partnership with uh, the largest food retailer in the province of Quebec, who has uh, about 200 stores in the province. Uh, and what they did was for over two years, they gave us literally all their data, all their transactional data uh, for all the, the things sold, um, all of their data about loyalty card members. We don't have anything about the actual individual people. We just have the linkage, so we know it's a consistent person, if you will. Uh, we have some rough geographic information. Actually, it's the only thing we have about the person. Um, and then we also have a basket table, which links the you know, individual items into baskets. Uh, and then we know about all their products. And so this is a lot of data, over a terabyte of data, uh, with you know, thousands and thousands of items, millions of sales, and billions of dollars of sales. So there's a lot of data. It's really exciting. Um, but it raises kind of informatics problems, uh, if you will, <laughs> in how you manage it. Uh, so one thing we started to do is, is look at a really simple metric for a healthy food basket. Uh, this metric just looks at, of the food items in your basket, and so those are all the things you leave with from one, one visit to the store, uh, if, we, if we get rid of non-food items, what proportion of cost is going to fruit and vegetables? So that was, I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to find more interesting metrics, but this was one that seemed to, on the face of it, uh, make sense. And then so we started by just taking one, one store, for example. Uh, and here you can see this store had over that period about 2.3 million baskets sold. And then we, we pull out the loyalty card holders. So those are the people who are using those cards to purchase so we can link their baskets over time. Uh, and that was actually, so there's about 58% uh, uh, of, of the people who purchased were loyalty card holders, but they accounted for almost 72% of the spending, which is not unusual. So the loyalty card, that's why they call them loyal, I guess. They come back more often and they spend more. So uh, what we did here was just to look and see, and, and in terms of that metric, you can see overall it's about 20% by, by value of those people's purchasing of food items was fruits and vegetables. Um, and you can see how it breaks down individually into fruits and vegetables there. But we've also started to look at patterns over time uh, to try and see if public health messaging is working. So around carbonated soft drinks, the messaging from public health is pretty straightforward, is drink less or don't drink any at all. Uh, and in this chart here, that is kind of a purple line. I don't have a pointer, but it's the one that you can actually see dropping somewhat precipitously. Is there a point? Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, am I shooting myself? So this, this one here is the is soft drinks dropping, which we were 
encouraged to see, but we wanted to see that within the same baskets, when people buy less soft drinks, what do they do? Do they buy something else? And as you can see, we do see an increase in juice. <laughs> uh, so, which is just another kind of sugar. Um, but uh, in the end, we're, we're digging more into this to try and see like, if, uh, within a household, what kind of dynamics are we seeing as people respond to some, one type of public health messaging, is it actually making their overall basket healthier uh, or not? So anyway, that, that's, that's a quick run through um, the overall, sort of the bigger picture of the context uh, in the Population Health Record Project and some of the work we've done around indicators, particularly these food-based indicators. Now I want to just, uh, for the rest of the talk, next to 50 minutes or so, just talk about what we're doing to try and help people use indicators intelligently. So, um, my, my, as a person in public health surveillance, I think that we do a really bad job. I mean, surveillance involves collecting data, analyzing it, interpreting what's going on, then feeding it back to people that need to do something about it in public health. That's the definition. It's that last step that I think we do a really bad job at. Sometimes make things available, but very rarely do we do it in a way that really facilitates people making good decisions. Uh, and so this is one area we're really trying to do a lot of work, trying to understand what do people really do with public health indicators? How do they use them? How could they use them? And how can we make that more effective? So kind of much more of an informatics perspective, if you will. And so here's a list of things that we've, we've designed or put forward that we're doing in this regard. One is doing a lot of user-centered design around that interface, and I'll say a few words about that. But most of it's really around developing methods, either AI, statistical epidemiologic methods that address tasks, people, things are trying to do in population and public health. And so you can see a list of them there, and I'll give you some examples from each of those. Uh, and then finally, the real way of, of figuring out if something is useful is that we incorporate into that POPHR platform I showed you, and we can do cluster randomized trials of, a, of an intervention as a, some sort of an indicator or some kind of way to use an indicator, and then actually literally measure through clickstream on the, on the application, but also through questionnaires and so on, is it actually, are people doing something different, and are they doing something different in the way that we'd hoped it would be? So first of all, user-centered design. We've had a number of workshops uh, around our application that we've built. Uh, it's still very much in evolution, but for the most part, people do find it useful uh, and are quite excited about the way it actually brings together different indicators in, in a kind of a terminus of health framework. Uh, it's, I, I'm happy to, at the end, I'll, I'll give the uh, web address and it's open. Anybody that wants to take a look is allowed to with the data that we have for the region of Montreal. But it, it does the usual kind of things with mapping and, and giving rates uh, standardized and so on. Possible to stratify, filter, uh, et cetera. Um, in terms of the interesting things that we're doing to uh, help people, the first thing I mentioned when I talked about a population health record is that even at the time of definition, people said you really need some way to organize the information for people. You can't just throw a laundry list of indicators at them. Uh, and the natural way to organize information, given that we're in public health, is to use a determinants of health framework. And so here is, is a classic Evans and Stoddard determinants of health framework. It's inspiring, but it's kind of a little too abstract to be terribly useful for what we're trying to accomplish. So we had to kind of go forward a little farther. And so the next step, if you will, is to create what's what I call a conceptual graph. So here we're drawing these ovals, which are concepts, and we're connecting ovals with arcs, which suggest causality in somebody's head anyway. Uh, and then if you have a skeleton, if you will, like that, of concepts and how they're causally related, we can then hang our indicators, which are shown in blue, off of any concept. So the knowledge, if you will, becomes this backbone for interpreting the information or indicators. What's nice about it, too, is that if we actually make that knowledge formal in the sense that the, it can be computed over, then we can actually do all sorts of interesting things by traversing causal trees and by rolling up and down disease categories and actually using the structure of that knowledge to interpret the information. Uh, and so that's what we've done. We've actually, we started actually by stealing first an Australian ontology, which is a, what you're supposed to do in knowledge modeling, is find someone else who's done this. Uh, a group in Australia did a, not a bad job with an ontology, which we took. Uh, we re-entered it in logic because they'd use a different sort of way of doing it. And then we added a number of causal relationships between uh, uh, items. Um, and as you can see, what this sort of um, structure allows you to do, as I mentioned before, uh, you can see hierarchies. So you can see that the BMI is a personal attribute. You can see that diabetes uh, is a type of disease or chronic disease. But, and those are sort of the taxonomic or hierarchical relationships in an ontology. But also what's quite powerful are what we call associative relationships, which you see here in orange. 
So you can also say that something causes something or something's a part of something and allows you to do much more expressive exploration of the knowledge and then of all the information connected to the knowledge. So one thing we've done in our application with this knowledge is quite literally when you ask about something at a population health level like diabetes, we will show you a causal graph. And we'll say, well, the concept in the center is diabetes. The things to the left we know are upstream causes, and the things to the right are downstream causes. And so that's, that's basically just showing you the concept. Below each concept, you can see a little drop-down box which gives you all the metrics or measurements we have of that concept. And then what we do is for the default metrics or default indicators, we compute just the bivariate correlation at a small geographic area between a default indicator. And so you can see here, we're showing a negative, fairly strong negative correlation between mean household income and prevalence of diabetes, which we expect to see, and fairly strong correlations on the downstream. And this is one area where we realize bivariate correlation is really simplistic, and so we're trying to get much smarter at thinking of other kind of larger graph-based causal discovery methods we can use to actually look at, this, look at the information on top of this causal structure that we have. Uh, we can also use the same causal structure to now show people on the top, they're looking at a map and time series for the same, same thing, diabetes, and now they're actually seeing distributions of downstream and upstream indicators below it. So they're actually seeing, a, for example, that the things you saw before on the left side of the graph are now showing a rug plot where they've selected one area, park extension, it's the green dot, and all the other regions are the grayed out dots. So you can see it's actually got the lowest household income of all the regions in our, in our data set, uh, and fairly high downstream uh, consequences as well. So that's, that's one way that we bring that kind of formal causal structure into, a, into our environment and we use it to organize the information. We're also interested in trying to identify health regions that are different. And so we were inspired here by, so this is kind of a prioritization problem in a region. If you've got, as every region does, many health problems, how do you, how do you have discussions around what's most important? Obviously there's a lot of values involved, but we're trying to come up with some kind of tools that can help to make that transparent. This is a very simple way of looking at this just with incidence measures. All we've done is look at incidence of some of the most common chronic diseases within one region and rank the incidence. And that's what you see by the ranking and also the size of the circle tells you the, the, the actual incidence for those conditions. But then we also look across regions and we say, and that's the coloring. And, and so we, we actually standardize values across regions. So you can see for hypertension, not only is it the highest incidence of all of these conditions in this region, but it's also higher than most other regions. Whereas something like asthma that falls in the middle here is actually kind of lower compared to other regions. And so this is, the idea here is just to think about facets or aspects of conditions that we can measure quantitatively and then combine somehow to help people prioritize in a transparent way, again. And this is a big challenge we have in Canada, anyway, in public health regions, is they're constantly trying to present what are their most important problems, what are they prioritizing for, uh, um, for action, and then being able to defend that decision. We also uh, done a fair bit of work trying to identify um, population subgroups with similar trajectories. This is a bit more of a health services context here, but this is one strategy we did, which is basically just looking across multiple indicators of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And what you see here are little regions. We've done a basic hierarchical clustering strategy on the time series of these indicators over time and identified five different clusters that if we look at uh, in terms of their healthcare utilization actually seem to be quite different. So here we've got four different types of healthcare utilization, family physician visits, specialist visits, emergency department visits, and hospitalizations. And each line connects the values for one geographic region. And then we cluster using the method I just showed you, these, these not really time series, but these patterns, if you will, across these regions. And as you can see, we, we have some regions that are particularly interesting. If you just contrast the green and the blue, or sorry, the green and the red, you can see the green has low family physician use, average specialist use, average ED use, and average hospitalization, whereas in the red, they have low GP use and very high ED visit rates. And so for healthcare administrators, this kind of looking across multiple indicators of, of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, one condition, they now can start to generate hypotheses about, wow, what's going on in that, that set of regions? Why, why are things different? We're also, and I'm much more excited about this work, to be honest, we're also looking at how can we um, do a much better job at modeling individual patient trajectories. So if you think about most of our indicators right now for patients, they're very cross-sectional. We just say, you've got COPD or you've got this. 
What we'd like to be able to do is have some way of, of actually following patients' healthcare trajectories over time and then being able to create indicators based on location or state within a trajectory. So here, for example, are two different patients with COPD that we fit a hidden Markov model to. And this is showing the, 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 what we can recover from the model uh, in terms of the state they're in. So there's three states of COPD, one, two, and three. Uh, and the outcome we were using as a measure of, of severity is the total number of drugs they were on, which is the blue dots. And so the observables are the blue dots. And as you can see, the, the model is, is positioning the person into a different state over time based upon how that drug use is changing. And so this could be used, for example, if you had patients with, for example, say COPD, and you knew that you had 50 of them in a region or 100 of them in a region, you could categorize them by state and have a sense that the higher state people are probably going to have much higher healthcare utilization in the next year than the lower state ones. You can even get a number of the number of peop the people that are likely to transition state next year, which would also give you a sense of what's the likely increase in utilization. So this is an area that we're, we're quite excited about. Okay. Um, now, forecasting future use, I won't say a lot about this, but uh, we were just talking a bit about Bayesian state spatiotemporal modeling. Uh, and so this is work that we're doing within the pop HR system to see if we can just do a better job of projecting out. Based on what we're seeing so far, where do we think that, I think in this case it's diabetes incidence we're looking at, where do we think diabetes incidence is going to go in the future in this region? And so this is relatively straightforward state space modeling at, at the moment, I would say, um, but we have the potential to make this much more uh, interesting by separating out some demographic effects from uh, what you might consider behavioral effects in terms of what's driving the disease. Um, but here, what's interesting is, and this is, I think, a really interesting point, is that if we look at the overall temporal pattern, it's going down in terms of diabetes incidence. But what you can see is that we do still have some regions, like in the top left, where it's going up, and also down here on the bottom where it's going up. So this, again, speaks to health inequalities in our, in our larger region. Even though, in general, everybody's getting, like, the incidence of diabetes is going down, we still have a, a number of smaller regions where the incidence is actually going up. Uh, and so we think this is an important tool for people to have a good sense of, you know, where the focus ought to be in terms of interventions if we're trying to decrease health inequalities. Okay. The final thing I'll talk about is proposing interventions. So all we've talked about so far really is information. We have a lot of data. We've created a lot of indicators. We've connected them using that knowledge that we have in the background. But now we want to think about interventions. Uh, and going back to that, that evidence-based public health theory I mentioned before, they actually break down evidence into three types. Type one is what, what we consider causal evidence of the type that we actually use within our graph to organize indicators. So smoking causes lung cancer. That's, that's the example of type one. Type two evidence is what can we do about that? So it, this would be an example that if you increase price through the media campaign, you're going to decrease, uh, sorry, this is price increases the target meeting campaign, reduce smoking rates. So type two is really like an intervention. Someone who's done an intervention trial, they've shown it to be effective, it's been published. That's type two evidence. And so what we're trying to do now is we've got that type one evidence organizing our information, if you will, that causal knowledge. And now we want to be able to bring type two evidence in and really push it to people. So when they're looking at populations, we know a lot about those populations from the information we've calculated. We can go out and pull evidence from the biomedical literature and push in front of them effective interventions. And so if you think about it, this is where most, um, most information systems are giving you indicators about popul health, population health, kind of like a laundry list, as you see over there. As I said, what we do right now in PopHR is we use that type one causal information to create that structure, that linkage between things. And now we'd like to be able to sort of bring in these interventions that would be literally tagged to certain concepts, if you will, uh, although we could also traverse the knowledge, the causal knowledge tree and figure out what upstream interventions will have what downstream effects likely. Um, and then the third piece where we're not really quite ready for yet, but you might imagine if somebody's using a system like PopHR routinely and they're recording the interventions they do, then you could actually get data over time about how the same intervention was implemented differently in different places and how effective it was or was not. And it would almost become kind of like a learning system, if you will. Um, but that's a, a potential direction in the future. So. It's a little ambitious, but uh, essentially the last thing that we're doing then is uh, we're just in the process of going towards kind of a precision public health model, if you will. The idea here is that we can precisely match or link interventions to populations. What does that mean? It means we have to be able to come from populations, define populations where we have very detailed information with their characteristics. 
which is what we're doing with the Pop HR project right now, although admittedly there might be some types of information that are not always available for every intervention. Um, and we're working with a partner called healthevidence.org, uh, or yeah, healthevidence.org. They're funded by the Canadian government to, do, to create basically a, a repository of systematic reviews of public health interventions. And so we're working with them to improve the annotation of that knowledge base so that our ontology can actually connect directly to that knowledge base. Uh, and then, this is the hard part, we're now working on the kind of the matching algorithm. So how do we take information and evidence and figure out if there's a good connection? This intervention is likely to have a good effect in this population, and then we can propose those interventions to people. So if you're actually working, for example, on diabetes, you're looking at a certain context, and we know something about the context, we can filter through all the interventions that might reduce diabetes and give the ones to you that we think are most likely to be effective uh, in your context. And this is, as you can see, the analogy to, analogous, analogy to precision medicine here, but instead of operating on individuals, we're operating on populations, and we're not that excited about genomics because at a population scale like this, it, we just don't have those data and they haven't been shown to be terribly important, we're really much more about all the other information we have. So, yeah, so with that, I'll just close by pointing out that this is a huge team of people that have been working on this, uh, which I think really goes to the multi slash transdisciplinary nature of, of research like this. You really need a lot of people from many different perspectives to, to get things like this working. Um, and I should be very thankful to our funding support. Uh, uh, we have burned through a lot of money. Uh, and we have some publications which will be available uh, on this list anyway, if you'd like to look at those. And here are the websites I mentioned. If you want to take a look at the application, you can just go here. You have to fill out a short form and, and ask for access, and you'll be granted access. Uh, and then that's our laboratory website with uh, more information. Thank you.